The Mortality of Trees in Exerbia's Pastoral Modernity. Challenging conservation practices to move beyond deferring dialogue about the meanings and values of environments by Kirsten Valentine Cadieu. Chapter 10 in the book, Landscape and the Ideology of Nature in Exerbia, Green Sprawl, edited by Kirsten Valentine Cadieu and Laura Taylor. Editor's Introduction. In this chapter, Valentine Cadieu explores the paradoxical nature of the modern pastoral. An idea drawn from Frankfurt School critical theory, architectural theory, and analysis of literature and literature of the environment. The modern pastoral refers to a technologically enabled idealization of the natural environment that obscures the industrial processes that make the green sprawl landscape and its aesthetic appreciation possible. The ways that exurban residents modify landscapes to reflect their ideologies are a central theme of this book. Kadua makes the idea of the modern pastoral accessible by taking a look at exurbanites' management of trees as an entry into understanding ideologies of nature and the ways these are made material. The seemingly simple act of planting a tree in a yard or just letting one grow is a symbolic act that can be unpacked to understand more about the culture of nature. In this chapter, Based on interviews with exurbanites in three sites, Southern Ontario, New England, and the Canterbury region of Aotearoa, New Zealand, Kadua finds that the life and death of trees are caught up in notions of ideal home landscapes in profound ways. Exurbanites have a tree fetish. Growing trees is a meaningful, even moral act, as is tree cutting. And Kadua argues that the broader trends and conflicts of the dispersion of the modern urban landscape are particularly well represented by the idealization of trees in Exerbia. After describing the meanings and symbolic functions of trees in the first half of this essay, in the second half she describes meanings and functions of pastorals and explains how moving beyond a mostly aesthetic or symbolic relationship, urbanizing landscapes could help expand current conservation practices into more equitable and sustainable modes of environmental governance. Valentine Cadieu at the time of writing, was a researcher and lecturer in geography and sociology at the University of Minnesota. She is interested in the way that people respond to and shape their environments, and in how residential landscapes are used or not used to provide for the needs of everyday life. She is author of several essays on the meaning and production of nature and agriculture, and ideological interactions with environments, and editor with Patrick Hurley, of a recent collection of papers on amenity migration in Exerbia published in a special issue of GeoJournal, and with Matthias Kvistrom of an issue of landscape research on combining landscape history and planning history in the study of peri-urban places and sprawl. This chapter comes out of several years of interviewing, living with, and visiting people who have chosen to live in natural settings and who have been willing to share their stories and also builds on work with land use managers and representatives of natural resource agencies trying to figure out how people understand and make decisions about their everyday landscapes. She is a geographer in the traditions of critical and anti-colonial cultural geography, feminist political ecology, and public social science, working to better understand and to build resilience and justice in society environment relationships. She uses collaborative ethnography to study societies and their environments through participating in public planning processes and facilitating dialogue about how people make sense of their social and environmental practices. Kadiu argues that in Exerbia, the pastoral symbolism of nature provides a foil for urban modernity, covering up the traits of industrial, late capitalist modernity that are difficult to think about, deal with, or acknowledge even if they are implicit in the segregated, energy-intensive form of Exerbia. As discussed in the previous chapters, Exerbia is a notorious site for clashes of environmental values. Attempts to collaboratively plan the amenity landscapes of green sprawl, often reforesting resource landscapes, often derail when economic or emotional values embedded in landscapes are difficult to address explicitly, and so are not discussed, but rather deferred, for example, through conservation mechanisms, such as restrictive zoning. Though, although not all conservation shares this common pitfall, a significant danger of the conservation paradigm, and particularly of private conservation, 
is the model it creates of privileged green zones, exacerbating both segregation and also differential access to the range of values embedded in green infrastructure. The symbolic green landscapes where nature is protected and allowed to grow free from certain kinds of human intervention are justified in terms of common good, but are allocated to those who already have more access and are made possible only through importing of lumber and other materials from other people's landscapes. The intractability of this contradiction is at the heart of this book's analysis of green sprawl. The pastoral idea of exurbia covers up and smooths over the parts of modern life that are aversive to think about. Traffic, noise, factories, environmental destruction, smog, social inequality. Removed from view, the issues are less urgent and less immediately objectionable. With problematic issues held at bay by the veneer of a pleasant landscape, it is easier not to protest, or more possible seeming to attempt to affect change solely by buying into green consumer lifestyles. Drawing to a conclusion, the conversation between the chapters in this book, this chapter discusses the exurban modern pastoral in terms of how cultural landscape narratives push and pull people between escaping troubling environmental problems and engaging with them, and hopefully offers to the everyday experience of this tension some ways to start talking about the meanings and values involved in society-environment relationships in exurban landscapes. I sat down to write this chapter after a weekend spent visiting a friend on his farm just northeast of Toronto. Visiting the farms and forests of friends and strangers is something I've taken to doing at any chance I get. A part of these visits is my ongoing effort to understand what it is that people who are escaping city or suburban life do with their escape. Living in the city myself, but having grown up in the urban escape areas of the American Northeast, I enjoy these visits as a retreat from what I perceive, for better or worse, as the geometric regularity and marketplace pace of the city, and as a return to a landscape of reforesting countryside familiar from my childhood. As I have learned to appreciate urban ecologies and landscapes, what these repeated visits have increasingly become for me is a compelling foray into the North American fascination with the naturalized pastoral landscape of Exurbia. As an idea of the good life, tinged with images of scenic farms and greenery, the pastoral is a traditional way to project a desirable way of life, or more accurately, a desirable setting, onto an existing lifestyle as a way of imagining the setting to project a desirable lifestyle achieved, the pastoral is an environmental and political sleight of hand. I use this interpretation of the pastoral as a starting place for my exploration of the ideology behind the lifestyle associated with the landscape of Exurbia and the socio-environmental questions exurbanites seem to direct at their landscape. Where is nature or the countryside? How can I live there? And then, what should I do now that I'm here? How am I a part of this environment? And what does being part of this environment make me? Considering the pastoral as a potent motivator, I interrogate the landscape of Exurbia and the people who live there and try to understand the relationship between the aspirations Exurbia represents and the contradictions it embodies. In the context of this book's discussion of Exurbia and sprawl, in terms of an ideology of nature, this chapter explores Exurbia as a pastoral landscape based on 15 years of ethnographic work in a wide range of peri-urban and exurban landscapes. As a land use and as an expression of an ideology, Exurbia has come to be understood as a place where people turn to a naturalized countryside in order to escape disamenities associated with urban residents. One could skeptically argue that the natural aesthetic of the exurban settlement form plays no more meaningful role than escape into exurban lifestyle and aesthetics as exurban havens spread with tremendous exuberance, converting vast tracts of erstwhile farmland and forest into a limbo of urbanization. While contributing to the considerable impacts of urban disinvestment, this new residential landscape neither takes on traditionally urban functions, aside from residents, nor does it retain its previously rural functional identity. In contrast to understanding Exurbia merely as escape, however, 
I also attempt to understand what many exurbanites have meant when they say that more intensive interaction with nature is the goal of exurbanization. The North American exurban pastoral landscape of houses set amid field and forest involves a search for nature, but also for a middle ground between the utopian haven that nature represents and the experience of globalizing urban modernity that seems to make some people feel havens necessary. This middle ground is where urban and rural models of environmental management encounter each other, and the landscape amalgam that often results involves conflicting signals of escape and engagement. Many of the signs and signifiers of landscape function are about doing things with the land, such as raising livestock, perhaps horses, but also goats, chickens, etc., managing forests or hobby farms, or just having a lot of land, or aesthetically invoking productive land uses via wagon wheels and other country trappings that have been made fashionable and commoditized. The landscape being reconfigured outside the suburban limits seems tremendously compelling for aspiring ruralites, in part because the promise of being able to do something with the environment, to manage a reforesting piece of land, for example, or to become involved in regional conservation efforts, stands in such contrast to the helplessness many people feel in relation to their environments and the environment writ large, and particularly to their perceptions of destructive environmental change. While exurbanites have been celebrated as champions of landscape conservation, the rationale for exurban conservation is often problematic. Environmentalist aesthetics may be used to provide legitimacy for conservation and to justify increased control of local environmental management regimes by exurbanites, often in competition with forestry or agricultural interests or with tourism. However, the problem with the modern pastoral is that the projection of an imagined rural idyll onto an actual material place is not likely to resolve the problems of green sprawl. Without extraordinary socio-ecological resilience, most green sprawl destinations are likely to struggle with the plights of both rural economies, grappling with global rural restructuring in productive sectors of the economy, and urban economies, competing to be seen as prime investments and to encourage only development that will facilitate continued economic growth. Exurbanization has become a successful strategy for conserving pleasant environmental islands in an era of neoliberalizing land use governance. Especially in metropolitan regions, exurban islands displace both resource-based land uses and land uses that are considered too urban, creating spaces where any productive dialogue between growth and conservation interests is unlikely to take place. I see this impasse as a common motive for deferring important discussions about how land uses and landscape management could better live up to people's environmental aspirations. Deferring active management regimes that reconcile values related to resource production, and also, arguably, related to reflexive inhabitation, as this has been described in the preceding chapters, exurban property accumulation and related preservation-based governance regimes often put off the development of compromise models of environmental governance in favor of preserving land unused for its aesthetic value. Despite legitimate justifications for environmental protection, exurbia's high social and environmental costs call exurban justifications into question and suggest the need for better land use governance strategies where urban and rural land uses intersect. In addition to exacerbating socio-spatial environmental justice problems, the reproduction of exurbia also poses a threat to the very environmental values expressed in the desire for something other than a metropolitan residential environment. Especially as homeowners, municipalities, and mortgage investors struggle to figure out the future of peri-urban housing political economies, it is worthwhile to understand the experiences and motives embedded in exurban landscapes. The residential call of the wild, the mythology of exurbia, beckons residents into the landscape that real estate billboards imply provides a new way of living. What does exurbia offer? By many accounts, exurbia's form of urbanization is ex, not merely because it is out from, but also extra, suburbia plus, even more comfortable with more lawn and trees, bigger houses, and the same goals of distinguished quality of life magnified. Questions about the sustainability of exurbia have traditionally centered on whether the way of life that exurbia promises 
can live up to the larger-than-life goals it seems to invite of its residents, and at what cost? How do cultural landscape narratives push and pull people between escaping troubling environmental problems and engaging with them? In this chapter, I explore the way that understanding exurban landscapes as natural undermines the possibility of reflexively inhabiting the landscapes of exurbia. And by extension, I examine the way that unselfconscious endorsement of the modern pastoral may inhibit reflexivity in any landscape. Interpreting the landscapes of exurbia and the narratives of its residents, I examine the role of the ideal of nature as it is manifested in the common exurban reforestation of agricultural and forestry land. What can we learn from this manifestation of a reforestation ideal? The impulse to relate to nature may entice exurbanites toward goals that turn out to be symbolic of other goals, goals that have been hidden in the complex processes involved in renaturalizing a regenerated farm into an imagined old growth forest, or becoming alienated from the procurement of forest products to such a degree that the cutting of any tree is protested. When people fight against goals they have identified with and taken on as their own, as in the widely supported fight against sprawl, despite the widely experienced desire to be surrounded with nature, the landscapes in question become contentious conundrums whose contradictions make them difficult to engage. These landscapes often fail to meet the goals expressed for them on all sides. Contradictions involved in the negotiations over landscapes of sprawl and nature can reveal more explicitly some of the choices that may appear inevitable or not available in the processes of urbanization that construct exurbia and green sprawl landscapes. A good relationship with nature, even in its symbolic form and green landscape ideals, often sounds a lot like an exploratory impulse toward figuring out what makes an environment a good home and how to act to shape good home environments. But in being compressed into the shorthand of symbolic nature, this exploratory aspiration rarely achieves reflective status, in which exurbanites and planners, for example, might consider more explicitly how their own tastes, practices, and politics shape their environmental management practices and ideals, and even their definition of what nature itself is or should be. The consequences of this lack of reflexivity in the search for home in nature can be seen in the tensions underlying one of the central conflicts in exurban land use, the widespread reforestation of exurbanized farm and forest lands. This naturalizing landscape trajectory provides an opportunity to examine conflicted ideas about interacting with exurban nature. Processes of urbanization and productive land uses, like the commercial agriculture and forestry that supply the material resources that support life in urban places, tend to coexist uneasily as exurbanites justify conservation of forests and hostility toward economic forest uses for primarily aesthetic reasons. This complex conflict can be read in the ways that many peri-urban areas have been transformed over the past 50 years, from active working landscapes to quietly reforesting exurbs. Exurbia very often combines the residential choice of a working landscape Homes are nestled in woodlots and ranches and reforesting fields and pastures of farms whose crops cannot compete with the profitability of residential land uses, with a search for nature, for a landscape of urban escape, or at least solace and respite, nature as an insulating cushion from the humanized landscape of the city or suburb. <laughs>